This is Anthony's story. Matthias Jones Mysteries by R.P. Fitton. Copyright 2019 by the Robert P. Fitton Revocable Trust. As read by the author. Anthony's Story by R.P. Fitton. Chapter 1. The Colonial House Restaurant, Main Street, Hamilton, New Hampshire. Some people are born stupid, some people become stupid, and some people have stupidity thrust upon them. Matthias Jones sat with his assistant coach, Woozy Williams, in the crowded Colonial House Restaurant. Franny McShane, still on duty waitressing, stood at the end of the booth in her aqua uniform. Since the college semester was over, he told Woozy and Franny he needed to have his Jeep's front end realigned. Yeah, so I told them. We just Over the restaurant buzz, Arnie Dewis's voice in the next booth the threatened I to squelch Jones' conversation. Now, I'll run you over with the forklift. Have Pudgy Wilson and Chucky realign it, Matthias, said so Franny said, as Arnie's grating voice continued to, to annoy Jones. The, the pencil face slim from the dump waved at Franny. Slim had buck teeth and long ears. Franny rolled her eyes. Jeep isn't that old, Matthias, said Woozy. Unless you hit something to get it out of alignment. Hey, Matthias! Slim was a mechanic! He can get that Jeep back in shape in a couple of minutes! Jones wondered why Slim wasn't still employed fixing cars. Thanks, Arnie. I'll uh, take care of it. Come on, the guy needs work, barked Arnie, rising from the booth. Don't be heartless. Jones lifted the coffee cup. Thanks, Arnie, but no thanks. You don't know what Slim can do. Arnie, what else can I get for you? Asked Franny, stepping over to the booth. More pancakes, Franny Wanny. Slim? Slim's eyes always hung low. What? Food? What about it? Jones looked at Woozy and shook his head. What else do you want for food? Nothing. Great, said Franny, glancing at Jones. Later on, Jones went home and didn't think any more about his Jeep. He watched the Red Sox game for five innings and then went to sleep. Just In the middle of the night, he place. vaguely heard banging Bang. and Arnie Dewis' voice Come outside. On, but he was too tired to get out of bed. With summer vacation, he had slept in to after nine o'clock. He dilly-dallied around the kitchen, gnawing on toast and jam, and sipping a coffee made with Big Mama's real ground coffee beans. The birds chirped in the green trees surrounding his fieldstone patio, and the traffic down Shore Road had subsided since the students went home. Jones had planned to get some bike accessories, which required traveling a half mile to Gunther's Bike Emporium past the Prince William Credit Union. When he later shifted his Jeep in front of his Colonial on the Common, he realized that his front end was now markedly out of alignment. He had trouble steering. The warm air swirled about in the Jeep's side windows as Arnie Dewis's unique personality continued to haunt Jones as he fought to control the Jeep's front end over the Devonshire Hills into Prince William. Jones slid a snub-nosed starter's pistol across his seat. In a few weeks, he and his buddy Kevin Phillips from the Prince William Police Department would race former Hamilton football captain Rick Morrow for a 20 miles along the shore. Rick's football team under Locke Larson did not win many games, but Rick's notoriety at Hamilton College came when he broke through the line like an out-of-control bull at St. Pat's quarterback Len Tilson. Tilson sidestepped Rick, but Rick's momentum sent him toward the Hamilton bench. He plowed into Lark, having a flirty conversation with the sexy Spanish professor Darlene Dibble. Lark ended up in the fourth row of bleaches and suffered a broken collarbone and four cracked ribs. He was unconscious for 15 minutes. Jones grinned and picked up his cell phone and placed a call to Arnie. The line rang as Jones passed the basalt rock ledges along Route 32, through the Devonshire Hills. Arnie, cell phone, said an abrupt, mean-spirited voice. Who is this? This is Evelyn Dewis. Who the hell are you? This is Coach Jones. Come on, Arnie, knock it off. Screw you, you misogynist. 
the jeep hummed along. Oh, look, Arnie's been avoiding me ever since he and that doofus Slim came over to wreck my car last night. I can't help it if you want a shit box. Jeep isn't that old. <laughs> you got rook, Cookamo, she said using Arnie's expression. The phone clicked as the cruiser lights began flashing behind him. Jones closed his eyes and pulled over. In the side mirror, he saw Wendell Harris step from his Hamilton cruiser. Jones looked out the window. Wendell flipped up his reflective sunglasses. His dark eyebrows moved upward as he spoke. License and registration. Wendell, you know who I am. Matthias, you're all over the road. I'm headed over to get my front end fixed. And I saw you blabbing away on the cell phone. And you have an unlicensed firearm on your front seat. It's a starter's pistol. Sure it is. Look, Wendell, just because George is visiting his sister doesn't mean you have to become chief enforcer. Jones' cell phone rang. Coach, this is Bucky Driscoll. Jones closed his eyes. What do you want? Wendell leaned in the window. I want season's tickets to the football games. Not you, Wendell. Huh? Bucky, look. I need to practice my singing. Yeah, you do that, Bucky. Goodbye. Jones looked up at Wendell. Wendell, I'll get you the tickets. How about a date with that business professor, Boom Boom Bailey? I don't even know her. Isn't her name Elizabeth? And you were speeding, said Wendell. I'll see what I can do, Wendell. Carry on, said Wendell as he flipped down the glasses and headed back to the cruiser. Jones studied his goofy walk in the side mirror. Jones's phone rang again. Jones, he growled. Hey, don't snap at me, Jonesy, said Coco. Because you let that moron do is bring in somebody to screw up your Jeep. I just got stopped on Route 32. Listen, don't head over to Ralphie's for your Jeep. My mother just set another place at the table. Coco, she didn't have to do that. I know she didn't have to. And eat what she puts in front of you, will you, Jonesy? Ralphie will pick up the Jeep from my mother's house. Then I want to show you the renovations we're doing at the club. I'll talk to you. Jones tapped the brake as he descended into Prince William. The brakes weren't tight either. He wondered if Arnie and Slim had messed with the brakes. Maybe it's just me. The three-story house had beige siding and a front porch canopy. The varnished front door with three vertical windows slowly opened. Some little guy with black-rimmed glasses and red suspenders stood as if he were in a shootout in the Old West. He wore a brown leather holster around his shoulder with a large black pistol. Yeah. Errol Pomeroy, he said with a serious face as he clamped Jones's hand. His grip was substantial. Mr. Pomeroy? Hey, Jonesy, where the hell you been? Asked Coco somewhere in the next room. The high-ceiling house from the last century was filled with aromas like the finest Italian restaurant. Jones heard Rita Stefani telling Uncle Dulio his appetite wasn't what it used to be. Then they were arguing whether some guy named Peter Bortoloni once owned Binky's Bakery in Chelsea, Massachusetts. Coco stood as the massive Uncle Dulio, in a white undershirt, kept eating. You happy now, Rita? asked Dulio, holding up a forkful of pasta with a huge meatball. Rita was at the stove with another lady with bleached blonde hair. Hey, it smells great, said Jones. Rita turned at the stove. Yeah, well, it tastes even better, Jonesy. Earl sat next to Dulio and lit a cigarette, then he drank coffee from a long, thin beer glass. Sit down, Jonesy, said Coco, gesturing toward the empty chair. As Jones took off his windbreaker and sat next to Coco, Rita shoved a plate overflowing with angel hair, pasta, and meatballs. Steam moved upward across his face. The bleached blonde lady grabbed his windbreaker and brought it into the next room. Coco poured Jones a glass of wine. What a feast, said Jones. So uh, who stopped you, Jonesy? asked Coco as the bread and rolls appeared on the center table. Wendell Harris, said Jones, twirling the pasta. The sauce swished around his mouth like an intoxicating drug. Harris? Harris is a buffoon. What's the matter? Didn't he make his quota for Strickland this month? Strickland's away and Wendell wanted football tickets and a date with Boom Boom Bailey. What? Coco set down his wine. Remember last year when Harris kept having flats on the cruiser? 
Yeah, George was going to take the cruiser away from him, said Jones, taking a sip of the red wine. He said Wendell was bringing his girlfriend up to that pothole road that leads into the quarries. No, no, that's not what happened. Harris was giving some of the girls at the club grief. Said he was going to arrest Beebe. My friend Winky, he has this uh, bag of screws. Winky is a stiff, said Earl. Jones laughed hard enough to set down the wine. No one messes with my girls. How's the pasta, Jonesy? asked Rita, her dark eyes glistening. Jones lifted the pasta and half a pierced meatball on his fork. You won't get this food in restaurants. Send the sausage down to Jonesy, John, said Rita, calling him by his real name. Coco swung an elongated platter stacked with sausage. Are you going to Hamilton Fletcher's 70th birthday bash on Fletcher Hill? asked Jones as he added sausage to his plate. I like to keep in the background when it comes to the Fletchers, Jonesy. Works out better that way. People don't need to know my connections to the college, except for the trustees. Plus, the old man has me keeping that scumbag Lou Malo away from the party. Lou Malo is lucky he's alive, said Earl, lighting another cigarette. Then he cracked his knuckles. So what does Lou Marlowe have to do with Hamilton Fletcher? The old man and Marlowe have hated each other for years, said Coco. Uncle Dulio's fist tightened. Then he banged it on the table, shaking the plates and glasses, but no one seemed to mind. That son of a bitch had something to do with Dorothy Fletcher's accident up in New York. Hamilton Fletcher swears Marlowe killed his wife. Sean Grogan said Lou was bragging about it, said Earl. Well, that was years ago. Who's Sean Grogan? asked Jones. Marlowe's hatchet man. I remember Grogan, said Dulio. One year he cost my Little League team the championship with the hidden ball routine. My boys didn't understand that. So Hamilton hates Marlowe, asked Jones as he lifted more twisted pasta on his fork. You don't get it, Jonesy. Way back when, just to spite the old man, Milo bought Kellogg paint in Massachusetts. He didn't care about making money as much as he wanted to put the old man out of business. It's his mission in life. Didn't work. It was a war. Lou Milo beats his wife, said the blonde. What are you, from the National Enquirer, Shirley? asked Coco. Hey, back to the party. The old man hired Tony Fontaine to sing at his birthday party. Ah, the Prince William swooner, said Rita. Mildred McCluskey always liked listening to Tony. My job is to keep Marlo off Fletcher Hill so he doesn't ruin the old man's celebration. My services are always available, said Earl. Come on, Earl, said Coco. Word is out. Marlo won't get near Fletcher Hill. Late that afternoon, Jones and Coco smoked cigars on the balcony overlooking East Crescent Street in Prince William. Jones liked the smell. It was like being back at the ballpark before they banned smoking. It was a long alley with kids playing baseball in the street. People sat outside with beer bottles in their hands. Jonesy, you need to settle down, man. Get married. Have the little Jonesies running around. No, you sound like Stephanie. <laughs> You're damn lucky that broad is out of your life. She's always barking out orders. Jones puffed on the cigar and nodded. You lived here all your life, Coco? My old man got this place after we moved from the Canal Street apartment. He still alive? asked Jones. Coco smiled. Yeah, he's alive. They call him Johnny. He's a big deal. He ain't been back here in years. He's in Vegas. He originally tried to fund the club. No strings. Guess he's trying to compensate for screwing up. I told him, thanks, but no thanks. I hear you. Sure, your old man was always there for you. He was. I need you to be my eyes and ears at the party. If Marlo shows up, I just may have Earl on standby. Yeah, I don't want to be a part of a murder. Jonesy, no one's asking you to be a part of a murder, said Coco, laughing with a cigar in his mouth. Come on, let's get over to the club. This place is going to look primo when I'm done. Anthony's Story by R.P. Fitton Chapter 2 Club Max, Front Street, Prince William, New Hampshire 
Bucky finished whacking the doorknob outside Club Max with the tire iron from his security car. Hey, I told you I could open this door. I don't think Coco's gonna like you breaking into Club Max. I want to get up there and sing happy birthday. Okay, it's your nickel, pal. You get up in the booth, Arnie, and you turn on all the machinery. Testing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, you're on the air, Buckster. Okay, this is Buckster Driscoll. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Hey, hey, what the hell is going on in here? What are you doing in here, Driscoll? Jonesy, who let Driscoll into the club? Hey, I'm just trying to sing happy birthday. No one's going to sing nothing. Now get the hell out of here. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Jonesy. Coco, I don't know anything about it. Jonesy, I'm going to take this guy out. I'm telling you right now. I'm sick of his bullshit. Hey, Coco, why don't you get up here and sing happy birthday? I ain't singing nothing. You're lucky I don't take you out, Driscoll. I've reached my limit with this guy, Jonesy. Hey, you missed. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday to you. music started again and Bucky and Arnie raced toward the door and into the parking lot. Coco handed the starter's pistol to Jones. I should have used a real gun. He and Dewis must have broken the door to get in here. Surprised the rodent has the cojones to break into the club. What are you going to do? Give Winky a call for starters. See how Mr. Dewis does with screws in his lumberyard parking lot. It's not too late to book Bucky for Hamilton's party. The only thing I'd book him for is to howl with the wolves up in the hills. Coco turned to the bar in the open area back toward his office. I get new furniture for the whole place, Jonesy. You must be doing well. Yeah, said Coco as his face tightened. Can't believe that rodent actually broke in here. Don't forget Arnie. Oh, do as we'll get his. Plus, I got the FBI snooping around. The FBI? Yeah, they sent a guy named Chick Mulvaney in here. I have no idea what's going on. Comes in here with his boys and starts asking me about drug shipments. You know me, Jonesy. I don't do drugs. Why would he ask you that? That's eh, not important. But I'm getting tired of seeing his puss here in the club. Jones walked down the length of a new, smooth, transparent plastic surface covering the top of the extended bar. He ran his fingers along the plastic. All the booths had been ripped out awaiting new tables. Coco's sliders remained the same down back. Coco, shaking his head, moved along the bar as Jones studied the elongated, hanging light fixtures. Driscoll is a walking time bomb and Dewis is the fuse. Jones laughed and leaned against the bar. So you have Fletcher Hill secure. I have a dozen guys blocking all access. Five years ago, the old man wanted me to call Mr. Fiore. Take somebody out because of what happened to his wife? Look, Jonesy, we just don't take people out. Coco shook his head and lit a cigarette. I can't prove Marlo or his people forced Dorothy off the road. She was a nice lady. The old man wasn't happy that I couldn't help him. But you think Marlo did it? Who knows? Said Coco, leaning against the plastic. Bruno ordered this bar from Switzerland. You can't chip it or burn it. The old bar kept getting all chewed up. They moved into the open expanse. And new lights? Right. Electrical inspectors said they were required to put in those bright efficiency bulbs. I made a call. Bright white bulbs will ruin the atmosphere in here. They reached a ripped open wall. What's this? A more intimate area. Are you kidding me? Hey, you seem to think I'm running some kind of brothel here, Jonesy. 
said with a grin. Then he pointed at Jones. Remember what I always tell you. Sometimes it's better not knowing nothing. Leaning between the petition was a poster-sized frame. Jones lifted it out, revealing a black-and-white photo of Coco sitting at the bar with what could be his twin, but with shorter hair. That's your brother. Coco held the cigarette out in front of his lips. His dark eyes tightened. Yeah, taken uh, seven years ago, he said, pointing back to the bar. Right over there. Anthony was in here all the time. Sorry. He'd just gotten engaged, Jonesy. He's on top of the world. Coco kept his back to Jones, but his voice was lower. Forty-eight hours later, and he goes missing. Uncle Dulio thinks Anthony was on his way to New York City. Why? Mr. Fiore eventually tracked down this gang, tough hombres. All hell broke loose. There were people dead in the city. Coco kept shaking his head as if reality would go away. I was down there for close to a month looking for Anthony. The old man let me use one of his cars just to throw him off. Finally, Fiore told me to drop it. New York? Why did... Why did Anthony get taken to New York? I ain't telling you that, Jonesy. There was never any definitive proof that Anthony was dead. That kid was a hundred times smarter than me, and the babes loved him. Jones studied the photograph. Who was the fiancé? Doesn't matter, does it? She's gone, and... Anthony ain't coming back. I love that kid, but he ain't coming back. Anthony's Story by R.P. Fitton Chapter 3 Fletcher Estate, Fletcher Hill, Hamilton, New Hampshire I hate Lou Malo. I've always hated Lou Malo. I've hated Lou Malo before I was born, bellowed Hamilton Fletcher from his second floor study. Jones, in a blue sport coat and white shirt, turned from the party-goers surrounding the pool and lawn behind the Fletcher mansion. He adjusted his blue silk tie in the mirror behind Hamilton Fletcher's desk. Then he fluffed up his brown hair. Mr. Fletcher, I know you two don't care for each other, but Marlowe's just a businessman from Prince William. Just a businessman? I won't have my 70th birthday ruined by that bum, said Hamilton, banging the desk. And by the way, put me down for five on that bike race you're in. Five? Five hundred, of course. Maybe I'll have Coco place some side bets on you. You are going to win, aren't you? Morrow weighs 315 pounds, and Kevin Phillips hasn't been on a bike in a year. Good. I always say bet on the sure thing, especially when you can fix it. Well, Coco and his people will keep Marlowe off the estate. I don't want my guest exposed to the Marlow Malaki. Jones stroked his chin and tightened his brow. Marlow sounds like a bad actor. That is the understatement of the year. Hamilton Fletcher's translucent blue eyes widened. Lou Marlow's mission in life since we were kids was to destroy me. Jones tilted his head slightly. Not good. Hamilton Fletcher slowly lifted a glass of scotch to his lips. His eyes settled in and he spoke in a slower, deeper voice as if he were tapping into his very soul. When I was seven years old, my brother Charles and I were competing in a potato sack race at the annual Tritown Fair. We were good, damn good. No one could touch us. He squinted as he peered out the window again, until that bastard tripped my brother and we went ass over elbow on the common grass. Jones straightened his tie. How old were you, sir? Seven, and Charles was five. Well, that was 63 years ago. The desk phone sounded a conventional ring. Well, I don't give a damn if it was a thousand years ago. Hamilton Fletcher lifted the phone. Mr. Fletcher, just avoid Marlowe. Rotten, no good bastard. Oh, no, not you, LG. What? What the hell are you doing in Bermuda? Right. No, it's Lou Marlowe. I have word he's going to crash my party. I know I shouldn't have threatened him, but he had it coming. Now I was hoping you'd be here, Algie. You could have postponed your daughter's wedding. Matthias, get Coco on the cell phone. Jones nodded and punched in Coco's number on his cell and panned the yard now filled with guests, drinks, and hors d'oeuvres. Jonesy, I'm busy. The guests are starting to arrive. What is it? I know. I see them. Mr. Fletcher wants to talk to you. Where are you, Coco? Never mind where I am. Hold on. I ain't got all day. Mr. Fletcher, said Jones. Coco. 
No, LG, I don't want you to call Herbert Lane. I don't need that tub of lard setting foot on Fletcher Hill. Just because you let him use your condos in Bermuda. Get back to your so-called family matters, LG. Goodbye. Hamilton Fletcher grabbed Jones' cell phone and pushed the speaker button. Coco, any sign of Marlowe? I have people blocking the drive and the perimeter into the woods. Hamilton Fletcher pointed his finger at the phone. You make sure that son of a bitch stays off my property. He handed the phone to Jones, and Jones shut off the speaker. Jones stepped into the side room so he could peer out the window. Coco. Jones, he's like an old lady. Well, you got that right. Me? Jones exhaled. I don't even know what this guy Marlowe looks like. Ask the old man. I'll talk to you. Great, said Jones, dropping the cell in his side pocket. Mr. Fletcher, said Jones, returning to the study. Coco wants me checking for Marlowe near the pool area. What does Marlowe look like? Hamilton Fletcher opened the closet door. A laminated dartboard, complete with darts, was embedded in the large black-and-white photo of a man with a cunning smile, charming eyes, and silver hair. That, Matthias, is Lou Marlowe. Loud feedback, probably from the PA system, vibrated the window glass. What in God's name is that? asked Hamilton Fletcher. He stomped across his study to the far window. I don't need any disasters up here today. What is it? asked Jones. Someone began singing off-key over the outside speakers. Who the hell is that? Where's Tony Fontaine? Hamilton's eyes popped open. It's that, that dunderhead, Driscoll. Disaster is Bucky's middle name. Hollings, called Hamilton Fletcher. Hollings! On the far side of the pool, beyond the buffet tables, Bucky Driscoll, looking more bulbous than usual in his tight sports shirt and Bermuda shorts, grasped a silver microphone in his hands. To his right, the gawky Arnie Dewis, in a blue Hawaiian shirt, pushed a large electrified black amplifier across the pool tiles within inches from the pool water. Now Jones grew nervous. That idiot's going to electrocute himself and the guests near the buffet table. Who, Driscoll? asked Hamilton Fletcher. No, Dewars. The balding Hollings appeared in the doorway. Dewars is not on the guest list, barked Hamilton Fletcher, and neither is Driscoll. Hollings, get Driscoll and Dewars off the property. Yes, sir. Matthias, with someone the stature of Tony Fontaine to serenade the gathering, I don't need Driscoll out there hauling. Wait, said Jones. Hollings, let me have the pleasure. Hollings looked at Hamilton Fletcher. Hamilton Fletcher creased his brow and then nodded. Very well. Thank you, Matthias, and let me know when Coco checks in. Jones tapped Holly's shoulder as he passed and moved down to the stairs. He held the varnished oak railing and descended the oriental runner. His phone messaging sounded as he passed under the stained glass window of a huge sailing ship. He tapped on a message from Coco Stefani and a duplicate of the dartboard picture of the thin mustached man wearing a gray triply hat appeared on the phone. His eyes sparkled blue and his tiny teeth were polished white. His mustache matched Hamilton Fletcher's mustache exactly. Lou Marlowe, said Jones as he walked across the downstairs hall and onto the spacious kitchen tiles. Juanita, the Fletcher's raven-haired maid, was directing a group of young girls near the food preparation area. Hello, Matthias, she said as Bucky Driscoll's voice sounded outside. Afternoon, Juanita. Juanita winced and blocked her ears. Yes, you stupid old idiot. Jones looked through the atrium door windows. I think I know what you mean. That man Driscoll, he tried to ask me over to Club Max. Jones squinted. Don't worry, I'll take care of Caruso. Jones opened the door to the buzz of at least a hundred people around the pool and lawn. Many people covered their ears. Jones inhaled the chlorinated pool air mixed with the hot food under a canopy to the right. He darted between the party goers in the afternoon sun and marched behind the diving board. People around the pool pointed to Bucky. Jones' eyes popped as he saw Arnie perched on the amplifier, clapping and rocking the electrified box as it tethered on the edge of the pool. Jones squared off in front of Bucky. All right, Bucky, put down the microphone. 
Come on, Matthias, this guy's got talent, shouted Arnie. Shut up, Arnie, yelled Jones, and get that amp away from the water. Ah, you worry too much. Plus, you're jealous of the Buckster. Not jealous of that cackling. Jones turned toward Bucky and tried to grab the mic. Hey, hands off the merchandise. You're all done, Bucky. Coco appeared near the pool house. His eyes popped and he stormed up to Bucky and Jones. His brow was creased. Hey, the professors in the music department say I'm going places. Hey, fatty Arbuckle, said Coco. You're going places, all right. Out of here. Now beat it. Bucky continued to grip the mic and his words echoed around the grounds. Oh, yeah, is that right, said Coco, stepping closer. How do you know I'm trained in Nazi? Said Bucky, putting up both hands in a self-defense stance. You are Nazi, shouted Coco. Coco lowered his heel behind Bucky's knee and the rotund Bucky flipped backward. The microphone cord straightened, pulling the amplifier and Arnie Dewars forward. Arnie spread his arms and legs, kicking the amplifier into the pool. He lost his footing as sparks flew and he belly flopped into the pool and remained face down. Oh no, he's dead, yelled Bucky, a ground on the tiles. And he's dead. Everybody, away from the water, shouted Jones. Coco grabbed the pool strainer and chopped the cord from the amplifier. Jones threw off his sport coat and dived into the pool and reached for the floating Arnie. He wrapped his arm around Arnie and cupped his chin. Then he sidestroked toward the pool's cement lip. A short Latin man ran along the pool as Jones lifted Arnie upward. And Dr. Mendoza from the Prince William Medical. Coco and Mendoza dragged Arnie out of the pool. Mendoza checked Arnie's heart. It's all my fault. I'm going to kill myself. Hey, let me do the honors, said Coco. Arnie, his moist hair matted down, quickly sat up. There we go. Two minutes. I held my breath for two minutes. You moron, I ought to plug that amp back in, said Coco. What's the matter? Can't you guys take a joke? Hey, Dewis, why don't you get back to that dump you call a lumberyard before I make a phone call and make your life a bigger living hell than it already is? Yeah, 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 said Arnie, grabbing a towel. Coco nodded at two large frame men near the buffet table. You better do as he says, Arnie, said Jones, if you know what's good for you. I gotta dry off. You've got to dry off, shouted Jones. Jones' silk tie had shrunk. He ripped it off and unbuttoned his shirt. His skin was chilled. Your stunt ruined my clothes, Arnie. Throw them in the dryer. The two hulks, who Jones had seen occasionally at Club Max, marched along the pool. They said nothing as Bucky wailed on the lawn. The dark-haired muscle man lifted Arnie over his shoulder and retreated toward the garage. Who invited doers in the road in anyways? Well, they weren't invited, said Jones, as Arnie complained by the pool house. Come on, I want to go swimming. Come on, lead back to the park. Arnie's gone, cried Bucky. Arnie's gone. Your friend is fine, Mr. Driscoll, yelled Mendoza. I want my mother. I'm going to jump from the Crosstown Bridge. I will, I will. <laughs> Warm up the car, Jonesy. He'll calm down. What about Marlowe? I got guys all over the property. Coco lit a cigarette. Nobody's seen Cool Lou. Cool Lou? Yeah. Well, maybe he'll let Hamilton just celebrate his birthday. I doubt it, said Coco, as Jones counted 15 people who were now chasing a screaming Bucky around the lawn. Look at that fool. Jones shrugged his shoulders. He thinks Arnie's dead. <laughs> Miracles can happen. Coco steered Jones under the canopy near the beach house. Bucky and his pursuers disappeared around the side of the mansion. Coco dropped his cigarette to the cement and snuffed it out with his shoe. Coco squinted as the long line of party-goers rounded the garage in pursuit of Bucky. Arnie's dead! Arnie's dead! Bucky darted to the right and disappeared around the garage with a conga line trailing after him. Jones opened his eyes wide as Bucky appeared at the top of the garage roof. He struggled to maintain his balance and his glasses were gone. What is it, Jonesy? Coco slowly turned. I don't deserve to live. I'm surprised Driscoll could climb up there. I'll jump. It's only six feet high. Bucky slipped, slid down the roof tiles, and landed in the flower bed as Mendoza and the others approached from behind. Bucky had passed out. The ambulance is on the way, said Mendoza. I'm bringing this man to the county psychiatric hospital. 
Should have done that the day the rodent was hatched, said Coco. Jones's phone rang. Jones. Dyer, said Hamilton Fletcher. What the hell's going on with Driscoll? It's being taken off the ground. Good work. Just keep a lookout for Lou Marlowe. I will. The line went dead. Over here, Jonesy. Coco motioned Jones away from the pool. They walked up the grassy grade toward the mesh fence overlooking the tennis courts. Coco's eyes focused on Jones. All I care about is keeping Marlowe off the grounds. I have the road and the highway covered, north and south. I still don't get it. All this hatred. I have to go home and change my clothes. Coco lit another cigarette. Look, Dorothy, way back when, was Marlowe's girl. The old man married her. Okay, okay, I get it. Marlowe never forgave either of them. Right. His walking papers were to make Hamilton Fletcher miserable, and vice versa. Exactly. Anthony's Story by R.P. Fitton, Chapter 4 Fletcher Estate, Fletcher Hill, Hamilton, New Hampshire Jones had taken a quick shower to get the chlorine off his body. He changed into an aqua shirt and a tan blazer. Late afternoon shadows draped the lawn, and the last sunlight sat atop the high-top trees in the mansion's slate-roof shingles. Now at least 300 guests, including the Hamilton College trustees, had gathered around the pool. Hollings and Juanita helped the servants roll out the huge cake with blazing candles. The smooth baritone voice of Tony Fontaine sauntered around the yard from oversized speakers as the crowd broke into Happy Birthday. Hamilton Fletcher, clad in a white suit, his tan face highlighting his blue eyes, looked delighted. His dark-haired son, Ham, put his hand on his father's shoulder as he sang. Coco exited the kitchen and headed down to Jones. <laughs> nice outfit, Jonesy. Stay away from the pool. Funny. Coco turned toward the tennis courts and put his hands on his hips. I still think Marlowe's going to show. From what you told me about this guy, Coco, I agree. The old man trusts you now. He's expecting big things this fall. You work in the inner circle. I get it. Good. I'll be right back. I want to make sure Marlowe doesn't sneak in and disrupt the toast. Jones nodded as Tony Fontaine began a crooning melody that even Jones didn't know. Against the dabbed high-cloud background, a small blue plane approached from the north. The humming motor reminded him of summer days back in Indiana. As the plane looped around and came closer, Jones noticed something painted on the belly of the plane. The silver-haired Lark Larson pointed skyward as someone leaped from the plane. Oh, Matthias, look, a sky jumper. Yeah, that's nice, Lark. In my younger years, I took the big leap. You? I wouldn't have believed it. During the war? Lark shielded his eyes. Oh, no, old boy. I took the big leap at the quarries. We lost Honker Hooker for the whole season. Waterlogged. You didn't go up in a plane? Lark paused and seemed confused. Not that I know of. Poor Honker. It's tough when a player gets knocked out of action, said Jones, as the brilliant orange chute opened below the high clouds. Oh no, Matthias, Honka went underwater, and three days later he called from a payphone on the New Jersey Turnpike. Jones stared at Lark and then back at the parachutist. Coco also looked skyward as he trotted down to Jones. I bet that's him, said Jones, pointing upward. That would be just like Malo to make a grand entrance, said Coco. Hello, Roco, said Lark. My name is Coco, Lawson. The plane proceeded northwest and out of sight. The huge orange chute slowly drifted in the air currents high above Fletcher Hill. How do we stop him, Coco? I'd plug Milo if I could get away with it. The old man's going to flip out if this is Milo, said Coco as Jones's phone rang. Jones. Matthias, you got to get me out of here. Bucky? Coco's face tightened. Where are you? I got one call. Are you in jail? Asked Jones, smiling as the parachute rocked. Hospital. Bucky, we told you that Arnie was all right. Give me that phone, said Coco, and Jones handed the phone to him. Hey, Driscoll, if you kept your big mouth shut, you wouldn't be going to the loony bin. Coco, you gotta help me. I'm screwed. <laughs> oh, well, pleasant dreams, Rodent. Coco cut the connection. Coco, said Lark, would you like to donate to the retired coach's defense and analysis fund? 
Get lost, Lawson. Can't you see we're busy? Come on, Jonesy. We'll head off Mala when he lands. Do I take that as a maybe? You can take whatever you want. Coco and Jones join a tour of the woods. I feel bad that Bucky's going to the psychiatric hospital, said Jones as he ran. That's a little bit over the top. Yeah, well, Driscoll's whole life is a little bit over the top. No question. Jones followed the chute, still several hundred feet above the ground, as it drifted toward Fletcher Hill. I tell you, it's Mallow. He'll land right in the old man's backyard. The right side of the chute collapsed. Then the entire chute folded into a vertical, furrowing stream. The jumper was limp as the body raced toward the ground. You've got to be kidding me, said Coco as he now sprinted into the woods behind the Fletcher garage. He's heading to the ground. Tree branches cracked and leaves spun into the air. The distinctive crunching sound lasted only a few seconds. Jones hurtled the bushes ahead of Coco. On the forest floor was a disfigured man in a gray, double-breasted suit with a red rose still in his lapel. As Jones slowed and moved closer, the gray mustache was still evident and the well-coiffed hair scattered about his bloody skull. Coco jogged up to him. Damn, it's Marlow, all right. Coco checked the chute ropes and then turned to Jones. Somebody snipped at the support ropes, Jonesy. You don't think Hamilton ordered this? <laughs> Nothing would surprise me. I would call Lane. Let him take care of it. Well, he may be the district attorney, but he's also an egomaniac, and he hates Hamilton. Coco looked back. Nobody even saw this. Fontaine was singing, and everyone was paying attention to the old man. Well, let me call Kevin Phillips. Strickland has jurisdiction here. He's at his sister's house in Arizona, Coco. Jones took out his cell phone and pushed the speed dial for Phillips. Coco, that shoot was cut somewhere else. Kevin Phillips. Kevin, it's Matthias. Matthias, I hope you're training as hard as I am for that bike ride. Jones glanced at the twisted body of Lou Marlowe. Kevin, I believe we have a murder here in Hamilton. What? I'm at Hamilton Fletcher's 70th birthday party. Lou Marlowe parachuted out of a small plane during Hamilton's party. The chute... Didn't open? Asked Phillips in a deadpan voice. Cord cut. Witnesses? Two. Coco and myself. Maybe Lark Larson. Lark Larson can't see two feet in front of him, said Phillips. Everyone was singing happy birthday to Hamilton. Coco leaned over the crumpled orange chute and the tangled ropes. You'll have to question everyone anyways, Kevin. We're in the woods behind the Fletcher garage. This is very bizarre. Marla probably left from the Prince William Airport, said Jones. Stay up there and don't let anyone near the crash. Will do, Kevin. Let me congratulate the brave jumper, said Lark as he appeared in the brush toward the garage. The guy's dead, Lawson, you idiot, said Coco. Oh, dear God! Locke's face and body froze. Jones looked into Coco's dark eyes. Hamilton has to be notified. Hamilton Fletcher followed Jones behind the long table loaded with birthday presents and he marched toward the garage. He paused in the driveway and peered out the front. Who the hell was that in the ambulance? Oh, that's not important. You listen to me, Matthias. If I say it's important, then it's important. Jones stepped toward the other side of the driveway. Mr. Fletcher, there's been a murder. Who's in the ambulance? Bucky Driscoll. Driscoll's dead? No, he's okay. Oh, then why is he in the ambulance? He asked, looking down the drive. You'll have to come out back, sir. PWPD has been called and Coco's guarding the body. Hamilton stomped across the driveway and rounded the garage. What's the damn mystery? Coco smoked a cigarette in front of the crushed area of bent branches and fallen green leaves. Lark was still motionless in the spot where Jones had left him. Coco moved up to Hamilton Fletcher as he trudged through the bushes. What the hell is going on here, Coco? Lou Malo, he's dead. Hamilton Fletcher didn't flinch, and he answered quickly. Good! Jones raised his brows. The police are on the way. Why the hell are they involved? asked Hamilton. Think you should call Bentley in Bermuda. You need legal representation. Technically, this happened on your property. What did you see, Larson? asked Hamilton Fletcher. Locke remained rigid and silent. Larson, you damn fool! What did you see? He's traumatized. <laughs> Story of his life. Hamilton Fletcher leaned over the snap branches. Ha! <laughs> Good riddance, Lou! Ha ha ha! He never had a chance, said Jones. Hamilton Fletcher shook his clenched fist. 
Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. Mr. Fletcher, said Coco in a lower voice, do you know anything about what happened here? Hamilton Fletcher rolled his tongue around his cheek. Then he evidenced a slight grin. I can't help it if Lou didn't know how to pack a parachute. Why do you say that? asked Jones. Hamilton Fletcher started back toward the party. A little birdie told me. What a great birthday present. Jones sidestepped over to Coco as Hamilton traipsed forward. What do you think? Who the hell knows, Jonesy, but the old man's jumping for joy, isn't he? An hour later, the forensics people had cordoned off the area and other police kept the party goers away. Word had already spread that Lou Marlowe had perished. What's the matter with him? asked Kevin Phillips, furrowing his brow as he studied Lark, still unmoving in the afternoon shadows. Larson's posing for a statue at the college, said Coco. Phillips removed his notebook. What did you guys see? The shoot was fine, said Jones. Then the right side just collapsed, Kevin. Phillips jotted what he said into the notebook. Yeah, he went down like a bullet, said Coco. Phillips nodded and turned to Lark. What did you witness, Coach Larson? Lark remained fixed in his position. Larson, wake up, you dummy, ordered Coco. I think we all understand what happened here, said Phillips. The forensic boys will let us know what happened to these ropes. We'll get a statement from Larson later. Phillips' phone rang. What? Kip, why are you calling me? Right. He what? Then just lock him up and shut the door. Not my problem. Kip Bosco? asked Jones. Yeah, Kip was at the county hospital when they brought in your security guard. He's not my security guard, said Jones. I guess there was a verbal confrontation. Coco stared back at the party. Yeah, Battle of the Titans. Who would want Marlowe dead? asked the sandy-haired Phillips. Jones' eyes opened wide as he looked at Coco. Coco swung back toward the party, but Jones spoke up. I'm sure a man like Marlowe didn't get to the top without stepping on toes. Now, Hamilton Fletcher was a competitor of Lou Marlowe since they were kids, argued Phillips. Coco turned. It's not the old man's style to be taking people out. And just who would, Coco? asked Phillips. How the hell do I know? Phillips put his notebook back in his shirt pocket. Do me a favor. If you hear anything, let me know. Right. That goes for you too, Matthias, said Phillips as he moved back toward Marlowe's body. Coco leaned toward Jones. Jonesy, I never give the cops nothing. I figured. They hiked back toward the grass where they were met by Hamilton Fletcher near the garage. He held a glass of scotch and ice. I suppose they've got me tried and convicted. Ah, Phillips is just snooping around, said Coco. I haven't been able to reach LG, his daughter's wedding, said Hamilton Fletcher. Look, Mr. Fletcher, said Coco, nobody's accusing you of killing Lou Marlow. Oh, they will. Sean Grogan will. Oh, yeah, the hatchet man, said Jones. Grogan is or was Lou Marlow's personal assistant, said Hamilton Fletcher. The man's a weasel, does all of Lou's dirty work. Coco spoke out the side of his mouth. If you need counsel, Mr. Fletcher, I can make a call to Boston. Hopefully it doesn't come to that. We'll keep our relationship strictly with the college trustees, Coco. Then he faced Jones and pointed his finger. I need a favor from you, Matthias, and you too, Coco. Sure, said Jones. Matthias, you have a talent for uncovering the uncoverable. Find who the hell packed Marlowe's chute and where he flew out of, and then report back to me. Well, I'm sure the police will find out, said Jones. It's summer, said Hamilton Fletcher, not listening to him. You should have plenty of time before your football team reports to practice. Six weeks. Good. Keep me informed. But, Mr. Fletcher... Hamilton Fletcher turned, but instead of returning to the party, he entered the mansion through the kitchen access. Coco lit a cigarette as Jones watched Wendell Harris in full uniform walk like a goof across the lawn to Hamilton Fletcher's first floor office. I am in charge here. Hey, go play in traffic, Harris, said Coco. I could lock you up. Yeah, you do that. Coco looked back to the crash site and then at Jones. What's the matter, Coco? Jonesy, I'm just not sure the old man didn't hire somebody to knock off Marlow.